this is it- Issues in Education continues. And our next panel includes Dr. Kim Ratcliffe, Associate Executive Director for Student Services of the Missouri School Boards Association. Dr. Jack Coward, the Superintendent of Fulton School District. And Dr. Art McCoy, Superintendent of Jennings School District. And welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for being with us. And I want to talk first of all about the importance of schools uh, meeting health and mental health needs of students. This is something that, again, has become more and more an issue. Uh, and we're starting to see school boards respond to it across the state. So what are those issues? Well, I think there's a number of issues, and we know that they're tied very closely to student achievement and to lifetime outcomes, and that's why schools are more involved in it today than they have been, that there are unmet needs. Children don't have access to health services that they require, um, and so the districts are looking for ways to respond. Jack's district and Arts are both investigating that art is into it a little bit more and art you might speak to that sure i mean the needs vary from uh just needing traditional doctor's visits type uh immunizations to needing more therapeutic services uh routine uh work that that insurance they may not have insurance for so i mean we have two health-based clinics in our school district that services every child from pre-k through high school for every uh, immunization as well as uh, vision dental uh, and therapeutic services to therapists per school. Uh, we try to be a trauma-informed school district, mm-hmm. so that means that we deal with the trauma that the families may face within their home and throughout the broader community. Uh, so we, we, we definitely make sure they get all so the So, Dr. McCoy, does, does that change any way the, the role of the, the nurse, mm-hmm. their traditional role? For does sure. Does that add other experts yes. into the staff yes it empowers the nurse so that they have a team of physicians that are like next door to them right. to then immediately refer the child and then that increases your daily attendance i mean we have an average of 97 percent daily attendance um wow. and, it, and it basically services the children's needs and i wondered uh, dr coward maybe you can speak to this as well the physicality of it when we're talking when i was in school it was about ramps hey we have ramps look how great we are yeah. but the physical needs have changed for the schools as well what are the new things that are needed well the the ramps are still a big issue elevators and, and the multi-story buildings but also the big the uh, more more critical issue for us is paraprofessionals to help those assist these students because typically if they have a physical disability there's some other related factors and that gets to the uh, as dr mccoy said the social emotional pieces and working through that and a lot of times uh, when you look at a child that's had some a couple of disability type factors there's disabilities rampant in that home and we're trying to reach out and figure out those pieces so that when that child comes to school in the morning we have a good experience walking it, well i tell my bus drivers they have a good experience on the bus <laughs> then walk in the door because they don't, they don't do well if they're not happy to start with. Indeed. And so uh, talk about the steps that the schools are taking to make sure that they're up to date as much as they can be from year to year. Well, we, we do our ADA compliance checks every year, and the fe- federal government has a pretty si- significant step. Uh, we try to kind of look at uh, little things, and uh, this next year we're going to really focus on sidewalks, uh, entrances, and eliminate those physical barriers to the to wheelchairs and people walking with um, crutches or disabilities and that doesn't seem like a lot to me but uh, I was on crutches for a couple of weeks with a knee problem and it was a thrill experience when you go through and try to get up those <laughs> stairs and try to work through work through that and and then other little things just uh, uh, I always like to walk in and see clean floors and clean floors are slick floors and maybe we have to look at how we're doing some of those things, too. You dirty up the floors a little bit. Well, right? yeah, that didn't work too well. <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Ratcliffe, talk about some of the services schools are now expected to provide because we have kids now who have uh, medications that they take every day. There are all kinds of things that, again, we didn't see as much maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Well, that's, that's very true. And I think to understand the context that schools – Um, From 1975, when there was the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act was passed, it was called something different then, but it was reauthorized, and that's how people know that term today, that this basically says that every child has access to school, and we have to do whatever it takes to allow that child to access school. And so when you consider that, then you have to start considering what are the barriers. And today, one of the biggest things that we're seeing is mental health 
issues. And that is a very um, challenging issue to deal with because you have community perception. You have um, stigmas attached to that. And as we try to uh, destigmatize that and to look for the kinds of support services that children need so that they feel safe, so that they come um, emotionally and mentally ready to learn has been an increasing challenge. But it also means that medication management, and that's a huge thing for nurses anymore. And a lot of their time is taken care of that. And when you look at the degree of chronic conditions that children now have from asthma you know, bipolar disorder, you have things like um, uh, type 2 diabetes, you have children with mental health issues that require medication. There's just the whole gamut there, and we want all of those children to be in our schools and to be successful in our schools, but the supports have increased sort of exponentially as as, uh, we Um, welcome every child into school and want them to be successful. I want to elaborate on some of those supports. So, for instance, we've purchased um, vehicles, um, minivans, to have shuttles back and forth to our two health-based clinics that services all eight of our schools. That's one. Two, we have asthma vans that go school to school to do monthly asthma checks, monthly um, uh, advice to students and families about how to regulate their home environment, but also the right medications. In addition, we have nurses as newborns, uh, nurses for newborns. So that means that every new, every mother with a newborn child gets a social worker and a mentor parent that does a home visit. Um, we have uh, health-based, uh, in addition to the health-based clinics, we have food giveaways, we have grocery giveaways, cooking classes, because a lot of it is how you regulate your diet as it pertains to diabetes and other things. So we offer those services uh, to parents and to students and give free groceries weekly to them so they can regulate their food. Because sometimes it's a, a, a food desert, a vegetable desert situation in certain parts of the urban environment. So, sure. So there are, there's just tons of additional new methods that lead towards a whole hol- a holistic whole wellness environment. We have peace rooms and comfort rooms in every school that includes a washer and dryer, but not only that, it includes a, a therapeutically healing environment, like a kind of a spa kind of right. music thing, and not sensory overkill, like most people have too much technology in front of right. them, too many hours on the screen. So we're desensitizing, or we're sensitive to those things, and they're de- often desensitized to what's in their environment, so we're showing them the alternatives that allow them to regulate their own Well, we're going to be talking a little later in the segment about uh, safe schools. So how does the mental health kind of cross over into the whole idea of creating safe learning environments where all can learn and teachers can teach? Well, we, we're doing similar things to what Dr. McCoy was referring to and trying to get the uh, our buildings up to speed on all those issues. Another factor in a lot of that issue is that uh, bringing your staff along. Uh, when you refer back to the uh, last 20 years, well, 20 years ago, I think most of us remember uh, Grandma in as a school nurse. Well, you know, we, that's not acceptable anymore. We're looking at RNs and professionals, and that's implied in some of the things he was talking about. But that's uh, when you get in our community, it was a new culture. Say, so, yeah, we need nurses. We need to do these things and make those connections. And then uh, it also comes back to the community to support uh, buildings, funding, you know, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you'd add a trailer to help that classroom out, and that's just not a safety issue. That's a safety issue now, and you're just not right. going to do that. Right. So it's a funding issue to come back and start looking at those well, pieces. Well, it's interesting. As we're designing schools, today's school is not like yesterday's schools. That's right. And to collaborate with the teachers in terms of their role and responsibilities throughout the day, that's right. the nurse, the principal, engage the parents, it's a different setting. Different. It I suspect is not you're doing the same. A suspect you're doing a lot of smaller conference rooms in schools as opposed to the class, you know, multi-classroom space with conference conference areas or privacy areas for Absolutely. therapy type Just services. Absolutely. Like Dr. That McCoy said, you know, those comfort areas. That's right. Uh, That's I would true. think maybe five, ten years ago that they were called timeout rooms. They're right. not called that no, anymore. Not, right? not that anymore. <laughs> different world. Different world. <laughs> well, and, and it seems like, too, that this is a place where a strong school board is an important thing Jeez. because you don't want to get into a situation where the school is expected to become a health care provider. Right. Schools still aren't doctors. So right. There's a difference between support and that. So 
Definitely. How do you keep those lines from blurring? Yeah, I, you know, I applaud the Jennings School District Board for having the, uh, the, the courage to understand that there are needs and that we should partner with the experts to have these collaborative new innovations so that we are not the sole owners of or the responsible agents to do, but that, that Children's Hospital is our main partner. BJC is a main partner. Express Scripts even hires uh, our students as, uh, as lab technicians. We have a CNA program. So, so it's a very kind of a home-based grow-your-own nurses from the student level up, hire your own employees that live in the region to help their, let them have a living wage in, in addition to good living ha- habits. But our board started with this focus of collaboration with the experts to incentivize and support the community. Uh, that's key. Which brings us right into funding. So talk a little bit about Medicaid and, and how organizations like that work into making schools a healthier environment. I, before I, I, I know I'm going to let my colleagues start on that, but, <laughs> but you asked a question that was important about Safe Schools yeah. Act. Mental health cannot be overemphasized. And by having people on site to do homicidal, suicidal, uh, uh, even investigations slash uh, assessments for students and our staff is is just a safety uh, mechanism that we've never had before. But that we have, I mean, let me give you an anecdotal story real quickly. A teacher saw a student in class, Mrs. Warren. She just wasn't looking like herself. She said, you need to go to the nurse. The nurse said, I don't know what's going on. Sent her to the spot clinic where we have a physician and staff. They did the assessment on the spot because they had permission to do what an outside agency would normally do. And uh, unfortunately, the girl was off the charts with uh, suicidal tendencies. She was hospitalized for that following week, and she came back to school and was better. But she said, I was going to kill myself wow. and had not articulated it. So it's that real-time availability for mental health that is crucial in today's society. Like well, when I'm before. in schools, I'm in a lot of schools, mm-hmm. I see the teachers always observing the kids. Mm-hmm. The eye contact that the teachers have on mm-hmm. the students, and mm-hmm. then as we design new schools, mm-hmm. you know, there's plenty of glass, mm-hmm. there's no hiding place. Mm-hmm. You know? These kids are observed continuously from the That's time right. they walk in the right. door mm-hmm. to throughout the day. So, yeah. just like yeah. you said. Saving when lives. You, when you get out state, it's a little more difficult to bring those connections. And the school is going to have to become more of a mental health provider because we just don't have the resources or the folks in the community that can partner like uh, what Dr. McCoy's district mm-hmm. has. And we're, we're looking to add those kind of staff members to make those connections. And we see our, our major focus coming in the next couple of years with, so, I don't know whether they're social workers or more nurses or counselors, we're looking for people that can make those connections because sometimes we have to get people out of out of our community, the surrounding communities, and that mileage may be the same as in St. Louis going across the street, but when you break outside of a defined community out state, it's a little different perception, I think, and kind of work, work through that. Right. And I think, Dennis, you're um, absolutely right on our, our teachers. Our teachers have had so much training with various, whether it's dyslexia, suicide prevention, bullying, it, it seems to be coming out of their ears at times, but they're good at identifying Very issues. Good. We just don't have enough people to start dealing with the issues when the kids get lined up outside the office or in the hallway or wherever that is in the, in the nurse's office. Right. So then you have to get back to it. How much leaning on uh, agencies like Medicaid do you end up doing? Well, actually, Medicaid is a huge part of funding the medical services under IDEA to begin with. There's actual federal law that that makes that connection and says it's the payer of first resort for medical services if a child is otherwise eligible. Um, and it's it's wonderful because we need to provide those. I've I was the director of special ed in Columbia for a number of years. We had children on full life support coming to school, and that involved pretty intensive nursing, but from one perspective to normalize the lives of those young people and to help them to be uh, surrounded by peers and to be learning and making their lives productive for whatever period of time you know they had was was the right thing to do and it was a wonderful thing that we could do but it took a lot of medical services medical services are very expensive services and there's one pot of money That's right. <laughs> if yes, I'm not right, right about right. that you tell me right. but um, and so to be able to have Medicaid when a child is eligible to be able to uh, fund those medical services and 
that's something that MSBA has worked very hard to do is to advocate for additional services. Um, we now can um, uh, look for assistance through billing Medicaid for occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language, private duty nursing, which is one-on-one -on -one nursing, personal care attendance when a child needs a personal care attendant all day with them for toileting, diapering, tube feeding, whatever it might be. Um, and mental health services. And we have partnered with um, our departments of uh, state, be them the Department of Mental Health, Department of Social Services, where Mo, where, uh, Mo Health Net, which is what mm -hmm. Medicaid is called in this state, is under. And as we've worked with, with those departments and Department of Health and Senior Services, which um, uh, works with school nurses, we have been able to get this fabulous response from those agencies to say, you know, we're better together. There's a, there's a great synergy going on now to look at what we can do to further support and sustain long-term um, health care, meeting the health care needs of our children in this state. And uh, there, I can't say enough about the cooperation and the vision we have for that. As a, as a superintendent, I just can't thank Kim Rockley for no oh. Dr. Rockley. <laughs> Seriously, because in addition to all that, which is 100% true, uh, she's an advocate and the agency, MSBA, is an advocate for students first. They have a task force that brings together all these agencies and the schools to inform, educate, get feedback, real-time feedback, and then advocate for more dollars, more help, more knowledge, and national uh, uh, networking. The national network aspect of bringing other experts from other states to come in and say this is how you do it best. That's under the leadership of, of uh, this organization and this great Thank person you. sitting next to me. Well, well, Dr. Kim Ratcliffe, Associate Executive.